You're listening to Just a Pinch Podcast with Injector Kristen. Join me and industry experts as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the aesthetics, wellness, and fitness industries. Welcome back to episode three of Just a Pinch Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today I'm going to be talking about the young patient. How young is too young? It's a really common question that we get asked in in practice is how young is too young to start with any and all of these treatments? And that's a really loaded question because if we're talking about skincare, quite literally, you cannot be too young. And we're going to do a deep dive into that. We're preventing a lot of problems that we can avoid as we get older. Or are we talking about cosmetic treatments? We're going to discuss both of them. Now, different providers will have differing opinions about this, and ultimately, it's going to be whatever that particular person is comfortable with. Personally, I will not treat cosmetically anybody under the age of 18. At 18, you're a consenting adult, and when we talk a little bit later today about the injectable side of things, I'll let you know what the FDA thinks too. But we're going to start off by talking about skincare. You are literally never too young to start taking good care of your skin. And when I say taking care of your skin, I mean treating it like any other organ in your body. Taking good care of your skin, using high quality skincare products, it does not make you vain. That is not something that makes you you self-absorbed and worried about your appearance. You're literally taking care of the biggest organ on your body. And taking proper care of it from a young age is going to help keep your skin healthier as you get older. Acne is a super common problem for a lot of young people, and it can start in some cases even in the preteen years when hormones start to rev up. Puberty is happening to children younger and younger as the years go on, so don't scoff at your 10-year-old that's, that's starting to get acne. Don't think that they're too young to treat it or that acne is just part of what going through puberty is and that it's just part of being a teenager. If you end up waiting too long to treat acne appropriately, you can actually cause permanent scarring. And that can cause a lot of other problems such as mental health distress, depression, insecurity. Some kids don't want to show their face in public. They hide their faces behind a hoodie. They don't want to pick their head up. They're feeling really embarrassed about their skin and that can really take a toll on them socially as they're developing. A lot of people will run to a dermatologist first, and this is going to be a little bit of a touchy subject because I love dermatologists. I absolutely respect their opinion, and I'm never, ever going to say that going to a dermatologist is the wrong thing to do. However, many dermatologists don't have on staff in their office a medical esthetician to perform facials, chemical peels, extractions, and other skincare procedures, and some don't even retail medical-grade products in the office. Some dermatologists are a little bit quick to reach for their prescription pad and start people on harsher prescription topicals and oral medications than I personally necessarily think is appropriate off the bat. But that's really not the case for all dermatologists. I'm absolutely not talking poorly about them at all. Uh, But my treatment theories of, of how I like to treat people is to start low and to go slow. Let's use the most mild treatments that we can use for your skin and then slowly escalate it and take slow steps up to find the best thing for you. So my recommendation for your child, if they start flaring up with acne, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying the -the over-the-counter products, the Neutrogena's, the Clearasil, the Clean and Clear, Proactive, all the stuff that you can find in a CVS or Walgreens. There's nothing technically wrong with trying that first. It's affordable. And in some cases, it's perfectly fine for spot treating. But a lot of people aren't going to do extraordinarily well with those products, and it can cause a lot of skin irritation, and in some cases can even make it worse. So my number one recommendation when treating your child is to find a licensed medical esthetician that has excellent knowledge in treating acne, and especially in treating young skin. Ideally, that esthetician will be associated with a medical provider at like a medical spa, uh, a dermatology office, somebody that has access in-house to a physician assistant like myself, a nurse practitioner, or a physician. Uh, so that way, the provider can also take part in the skincare. Now, that medical aesthetics office 
will have a much wider array of home care products that you can use to help treat that acne. It's gonna contain ingredients that you can't find over the counter, and oftentimes at much higher concentrations that are not available in over-the-counter drugstore brands uh, or Sephora or Ulta. At Radiance Med Spa, we absolutely adore face reality. That's what we use in our office for our acne treatments. It's fantastic for everybody because it's affordable and it's effective. It's part of a bigger program. Uh, we offer the Acne Clinic program, and we're going to hear a lot more about that program when we do a deep dive on acne. Uh, but just as a, a little background information on it, it's a program that's meant for people of all ages, from young to old, who suffer from acne or rosacea. Our medical esthetician sees you routinely for facials, chemical peels, and dialing in what your home care products are. The nice thing is with face reality, you don't have to be a part of the acne clinic to buy them. You can also just buy them on your own. You can walk in, ask for a little guidance and what, what you think would be best for you. You can even schedule a complimentary consultation with our very talented and very experienced medical esthetician, Jessica, and she can help dial in what your product should be at home. You're going to have things like regular facials, extractions, decongesting the pores, deep cleansing, in-depth skin analysis, and regimen tailoring for home. Sometimes even chemical peels will be used. If you're using the Face Reality Acne Clinic, you're going to routinely get chemical peels, and they can make a big difference in, in how your, your young skin is suffering with acne and rosacea. If you take control of your child's skin early, not only are you helping with their self-esteem, but you're also potentially saving them a lot of dough down the road. Treating acne scars as an adult can be painful, and it can be expensive. You could end up paying thousands of dollars after the acne is cleared up to fix the damage that it caused to their skin. There's been really, really severe acne scars that have, that have happened to people's skin where it li quite literally deforms the face. You get a lot of collagen and elastin loss. You get scar tissue formation. The skin gets tacked down. It gets firm. You get big indentations out of it, and it can be really difficult to treat. So going back to some great options for young skin, and this next one is not just for young skin, it's for all skin, but it's very, very important to start this at a young age, it's sunscreen. 100% the most important thing to start at a young age. And by a young age, I basically mean birth. From the time you come out the womb, you should be having sun precautions. And once you reach a certain age, that also includes sunscreen. Most of the sun damage that we accumulate that triggers aging skin, wrinkles, pigmentation issues can also trigger skin cancer. Wearing an SPF as an adult is very important, but staying protected during childhood is the most important to keep your skin healthy. Most of that damage is happening in those early years. You need to wear a sunscreen on, on all tones of skin, from the lightest of light to the darkest of dark. I don't care what your skin color is, you need to be wearing a daily sunscreen. Everybody has risk of, of skin cancer. My Fitzpatrick type 1, 2, and 3s definitely have the higher risk, but anybody of any skin tone, background, ethnicity can absolutely develop skin cancer. I want that SPF to be at least 30 or higher. If you're more prone to burning, let's look for a 50 plus. Ideally, that sunscreen should be a physical sunscreen, which means it's going to be a mineral-based product. You're going to see things like zinc oxide in it. But honestly, I'll take anything for compliance reasons. If, if you're grabbing a chemical one, banana boat, I don't, I don't care what it is, I just want you to use it. I want you to cover up your skin if possible. Absolutely, avoid fake tanning. UV tanning beds are hands down the worst possible thing that you can do for your skin. Your risk of skin cancer goes up dramatically. You're going to get hyperpigmentation in your skin and dark spots. You're going to get thick and leathery. I'm sure we've all seen pictures and videos of those old women on the beach in Florida who quite literally look like a piece of beef jerky. And that's from a lot of sun exposure, not just Florida sun, but oftentimes we're also fake tanning in the off seasons. You really want to avoid sunburns as much as possible. I myself have definitely not been as vigilant with my sunscreen when I was younger. Um, I'm wonderful about it now. I use it every single day. It's part of my regular skincare routine, but I sustained a lot of burns as a, as a child, especially in high school. Too cool for school. Didn't think I needed sunscreen. You know, I grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s in middle school and high school. Tan was in. 
that was when, you know, you laid outside, you put an oil on, the darker, the better. You turned all freckly from going in a tanning bed. You thought, oh, I'm getting good color. No, bitch, you're getting skin cancer. You're getting sun damage. Uh, Not good. You don't want to do that. I sustained a lot of really bad sunburns, too. When I was 14, never forget, it was the day before we went on a field trip to Washington, D.C., and it was our last day of school, and we all went over to our friend Eric's house, and we were all going to his pool. And I just parked up on one of the stairs in the in-ground pool, put my arms back, and just soaked up the sun. I, I really don't think that I had sunscreen on at all. And I sustained such a bad sunburn, I ended up with sun poisoning. My skin in, on my chest quite literally turned purple. It was so red, it was purple. I got second degree burns from it. I was so blistered. I was so hot and uncomfortable. And the next day I had to get on a bus and drive to Philadelphia and then to Washington, D.C. Those itchy seats made my skin crawl. I was so uncomfortable. My skin was peeling off in sheets off of my chest. And I had tan lines from my bikini top, quite literally through college from that one burn. So that's not tan lines. That is damage to my skin, and I damaged the hell out of it with that one single burn. And I can tell you for a fact, I sustained a lot more burns than just that one when I was young. Now, being almost 36, my chest is a problem area, and I know exactly why. There is, there's no other reason other than to point a finger at my own self for my stupidity in my younger years. You know, laughing at my mom when she's telling me to put on sunscreen and, you know, scoffing her off. She 100% knew what she was talking about, and I was a big, dumb idiot. And now I have decollete lines. Mind you, some of that is from sleep. But they are a lot deeper, and they're noticeable because I sustained all that sun damage. So sun damage equals wrinkles. No matter where you get it, it's going to equal wrinkles. And now I'm just really vigilant with my sunscreen. I cover up when I need to. If I'm out on my paddleboard in the summer, I'm putting on one of those SPF sun shirts with the rash guards. I really don't want sun to touch my chest. I have done enough. I have, I have screwed my skin up enough. So now we are trying to repair, doing things like laser resurfacing, microneedling, really good skincare products on my chest, just trying to fix it. And that's all from young sun damage, all from when I was about 14 years old. So very important to take care of your skin when you are that young. What's a good basic skincare routine for any young person with no active skin problems? And now when I say young person, I don't just mean like a 17 year old. I mean elementary school kids, literally elementary school kids. I want them to be using a very gentle, non-stripping facial cleanser. Enough with the soap, put down the Dove cleanser, put down the bar of ivory, the body wash. Stop cleaning your skin with that. The, the, on your face. Even as young people, you need to be taking care of your skin. And if you're putting genuine soap on your face, you're drying it out. You can create a lot of irritation, uh, especially if you suffer from eczema or skin rashes or just very sensitive skin. Avoid that soap. Do a nice, basic, gentle, non-stripping cleanser. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to take your eight-year-old to a medical spot to pick them out a, a $45 cleanser absolutely not. You can go to the local CVS or Walmart or Walgreens. And one of the best ones is CeraVe. You've probably seen it all over the internet. And it's there for a reason because it's one of the best dermatologist recommended non-comedogenic, non-irritating cleansers that you can possibly use. Now they make a whole line of other products. Honestly, they're great. They're really good. If you're looking for a really basic, gentle skincare product, product line to use for your your child, those are wonderful and I can't recommend them enough. So I'd honestly really recommend that line for people that are young that have no active skin problems. So we'll call it a CeraVe or a Cetaphil, very gentle non-stripping cleanser. If they're oily, you can pick out one that's a little bit more for acne prone. If they are dry or have um, irritated skin, tend to be prone to eczema and just irritation, Then I would look for a non-comedogenic moisturizer. Something basic, the CeraVe, perfect, love it. And then the last step, sunscreen. 
bring it right back to where we were. Sunscreen every single day. Even the sun exposure that you're getting, walking to the bus stop, walking to the car, out on the playground at recess, all of that's going to add up and it's going to increase your risk of, of skin cancer and just poor skin health as they get older. So important to have your kiddos just start it from a really young age. Make sunscreen part of their routine. I know it seems crazy. I know it seems like, Kristen, do you really think that in my chaotic, crazy day that I'm going to have the ability to remember to put sunscreen on my kids every single day? Listen, do your best. I, I'm not in there. I'm, I'm not in your house, you know, monitoring you. I'm not being the sunscreen Nazi. It's, it's totally up to you. I'm giving you my opinion. I think if you start kids on a sunscreen regimen where it's just part of their morning routine, leave it right next to their toothbrush every day. They put it on before they go to school. Brush your teeth, put on your sunscreen. Even if they're not cleansing their skin, using that gentle non-stripping cleanser, not using a moisturizer, sunscreen. And that goes for everybody. I don't care how old you are. If you put one single product on your skin every day, make sure it's sunscreen. Starting off with that nice basic skincare routine, we can then escalate it as needed. As their skin changes, as the seasons change, you'll probably notice that your skin gets a little bit more dry and irritated in the winter months. And it happens to your kids too, especially if they're eczema prone. Eczema is a huge problem for people of all ages, but especially kids. And I see and hear a lot about it now. Uh, back when I was working in primary care and urgent care, eczema was like, honestly, one of the other than, you know, runny noses, probably the number one complaint that I would hear from parents and see on kids. I know that allergies are up. Irritation is just up where you have environmental toxins and allergies and irritants and our world is full of chemicals that aren't meant to be there. And I'm seeing that in, in kids' skin now. Now, eczema is a whole topic that we could spend plenty of time with. But if they're, if they're dry and have eczema, you know, make sure that they're getting enough moisture in their skin. And that's going to help. It's going to help a little bit with the itching and the irritation. But we'll go over eczema in a, in a later episode and really dive into the nitty gritty and my personal favorite ways to treat it. All right, now it's time to circle back to cosmetic treatments. I like to separate out the injectables into, and, and other procedures, into two main categories when I think about them and when I talk about them and when I'm evaluating my patients. The first category is what I consider to be restorative treatments. A restorative treatment is going to be one that is restoring the skin and the anatomy of the face or whatever body area we're treating to its more natural and, quote, normal state of being. It means that your skin has changed from its natural state, and we are trying to rejuvenate it and restore it to look more rested, less aged, more normal. I also include scar treatments into this category, because if you have heavily scarred skin, it's not natural and normal looking. So we're trying to restore your skin back to its natural state. The other category is cosmetic treatments. That's taking a face that there's genuinely nothing wrong with. It's mostly going to be my younger people, um, usually under the age of 30. You're going to take a face that is fully naturally restored, unaged, and you're going to do treatments to them for a pure beauty purpose. That's going to be my 21-year-old that wants higher cheekbones, that more that contour. They want a more angled jaw. They want more straightening in their jaw. They want big, full lips that are shaped and changed from their baseline. So we have restorative treatments, which we're trying to restore a natural look. And we have cosmetic treatments that are taking a normal, fully restored face and changing it for the purposes solely of beauty. Now, when it comes to cosmetic treatments, companies have listed ages that they are FDA approved for. Now, as with all things, especially in aesthetic medicine, we can absolutely use off-label. Now, filler companies will typically say that they are approved for ages 22 and older, but we will oftentimes treat people that are younger. Bring it right back to, I personally choose not to do injectable treatments on anybody under the age of 18. If you are under 18, you are a child. Honestly, even at 18, I still consider you a child. 
but you are of consenting adult age. For neuromodulators, your Botox, Dysport, Zium, and Juvo, cosmetically, age 18 is where they are um, FDA approved for. Medically, especially if like treating for migraine headaches, you can treat as young as age 14. When it comes to the neuromodulators, Botox, Dysport, Zium, and Juvo, I am perfectly fine with people starting them early and young. And this is going to be a great preventative treatment. This is going to help prevent those dynamic wrinkles from forming in the first place. So we're going to see fewer lines and wrinkles as they age in the areas of the scowl line between the eyes, horizontal frontalis forehead lines, and crow's feet around the eyes. Sometimes we'll use it in other places, but with young people, it's typically when we're doing it for prevention, just those three upper areas. When we start somebody young with tox, we're going to do what we call baby Botox which is a reduced dose. We're not trying to fully freeze the muscles to zero movement. The goal is just to weaken them a little bit so that the skin is not creasing on itself with expression. This may be the only time and place that you're gonna hear me say that 25 units of Botox can actually be appropriate for the entire upper third area of the face. Uh, But everybody's different. You know, what one person might be able to get away with 25 units, somebody else might need a little bit more. Remember from last week's episode, I mentioned Xeomin. Xeomin is my favorite choice for the young patient that's looking to be preventative. Xeomin has a little bit more of a softer look and feel to it, has a little bit more natural expression, but you're going to still see fewer lines. Because this patient is younger, if they're planning on continuing to use these products throughout their lifespan, they're going to have decades of use. So we need to really think about decreasing their risk for resistance to that toxin over long-term use. Going straight to Botox or straight to Dysport isn't really going to be where where my brain is going when I have a a 25-year-old in my chair who wants to do a tox treatment for the first time. Xeomin will be my go-to. Now, not everybody carries that. There's no reason why you cannot use Botox and Dysport, but thinking about resistance over, over the lifespan that is something to take into consideration. Moving on to filler, this is a really touchy subject. And in my personal opinion, you need to be very, very judicious with filler. And that is a general statement. That's not just for the young patient, that is for all patients, but particularly with young patients. Even though the hyaluronic acid-based fillers, your Juvederm, Restylane, Versa, RHA collection, all of those, they're technically dissolvable. But if you're over injecting and you're over stretching the skin, you can damage the supporting structures of it. And if you try to go back to your natural state and dissolve, sometimes it won't look right. You can get stretched out skin, distorted anatomy. Lips are the biggest one to be careful with here. Overstuffing your lips, my favorite analogy for this, Sorry, it's crude, but it's true. 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. I grew up on a farm, typical there. So overstuffing your lips, putting too much filler in the lips than what your natural anatomy can hold appropriately is going to give you unnatural proportions and is a surefire way to damage your actual anatomy. If you have these massively huge lips, then you decide one day when you get a little older, you know what, this is kind of ridiculous. I think I'm ready to dissolve them and go a a bit smaller or just to not have lip filler at all. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you can have problems with that. They don't even have to be big, huge, porn star-esque looking lips. I've seen lips get stretched out and floppy kind of tissue looking afterwards from just a full lip. And options after dissolving a lip can include a couple of different things. Some people are going to have that internal or external panic attack looking at their lips after being dissolved, and they're not going to like the way they look. There's really three options, in my opinion, to help with this. One is injecting PRF or PRP into the lips. This is not going to be a big volumization for the lip tissue. It's more restorative to help stimulate collagen and elastin back into the lip to try to get some improvement in the quality of that lip tissue. Another option would be using smooth PDO threads. The third option is quite literally to give your anatomy time to rebound. 
if we think about women that are pregnant, they give birth, their belly stays stretched out for a while. That skin can look a little funky, um, sometimes even for upwards of a year. Some people, their skin never goes back to normal. It's a, kind of a good example for the lips if you overstuff them and then dissolve. Sometimes the skin just needs time to settle. It needs time to rebound and to contract and can look better over time. So the option, if you're not ready to do PRF injections or to try PDO threads, is to just give it time. Some people will rush to want to put back in filler, and sometimes we can, but sometimes putting in just one or two syringes of filler spaced over months still isn't going to be enough, and we're going to see a lot of that floppy, loose lip tissue, and the lips just aren't going to look right. So that's why we need to think about how we're injecting lips when, we, when we're starting out, and especially from a young age. A lot of lip filler is really overdone, and... I personally don't like the look. An overstuffed, overfilled lip, it's not beautiful. In my opinion, there's nothing wrong with a full lip within the constraints of your personal anatomy. When somebody's really young, instead of rushing into filler and lip filler, maybe consider using some topical lip plumpers or overlining your lips at first. The power of makeup is incredible. And it does not carry the same risks that injectables have. And you don't have to worry about long-term results of affecting and obstructing your own anatomy. When you're in your late teens and early mid-20s, your face is still changing. Mind you, our face is going to change for the rest of our lives. If you look at, uh, you know, a 21-year-old versus their grandmother, they look very, very different. So we're never going to stop evolving. But when you're that young, you still have... A lot of a childlike face. Your anatomy can still be very young and childlike. So it's still changing and developing. You haven't truly reached your adult face yet. So be careful with filler in areas like your jaw, your cheeks, and your chin. Let yourself develop a little bit. And you, there's no reason why you can't do it, but do it in really small amounts with a less is more approach. Move slowly throughout these corrections. I understand that there's things about one's personal anatomy that can make you feel insecure. Maybe you have a recessed chin or your jawline is really undefined and it makes you feel insecure about the way that your neck looks. Or you have a really flat cheek and you have no projection at all. And those are all basically normal variants of, of humans, of human anatomy. So there's technically nothing wrong with that. I don't ever want anybody to think that there's something wrong with their face because it's a little bit different than the -the run-of-the-mill average face of what we would consider to be normal and beautiful. These little things that make us different are the things that make us recognizable and beautiful in our own way. And while I understand that they can make you feel insecure, there are things that we can do about it, but we're going to do it slowly, we're going to do it carefully, because I will always have your best interest in mind, and I'm going to be thinking a lot longer term down the road in your life than you may be at this very moment. So trust your injector. If your injector is saying no to you, take a step back and really think about why they're saying no. We're not making any money when we say no to you. It does not behoove us financially to say no, especially if you're already here in the building for your appointment and we turn you away and say no. Please don't get upset with us. It's truly because we have your best interest in mind and thinking more long-term for your, your skin, your face, your anatomy. Too many cosmetic treatments, particularly the injectables and PDO threads at a really young age, will make you look older, but not in a good way. I know young people always want to look a little bit older, but this isn't the good kind of old. This is another big, in my opinion, moment I know that everybody thinks that Bella Hadid is this gorgeous, gorgeous supermodel. And she is. I will not take that from her. But in my opinion, she looks really harsh and she looks much older than she is, but like she's trying to look younger with procedures. I hope that makes sense. She is young. She is so young. She didn't need to do anything. And now because she's done so much... She looks like she's much older, trying to look her age with procedures. And that's a personal choice. 
We all have different opinions as to what we think looks good and what we think is beautiful. Who am I to judge? Honestly, but let's be real. I'm judging. We all judge. And we all know that we all judge. Even if we don't say it out loud, we are internally judging. We are human beings. This is what we do. So I want to make sure that my patients are really well educated before diving into cosmetic treatments. So what are some good treatments to start at a young age? There are plenty. If you really want to start and be preventative and take a proactive approach in your skin, start out with collagen stimulating treatments. We stop producing nice big natural amounts of collagen and elastin quite literally at age 20, sometimes even beforehand in our late teens. After that, we're not actively producing, we're losing about 1% a year. That all adds up. So one of the best things that you can do is do procedures that are going to stimulate your body to make that collagen and elastin again. Microneedling is one of my favorites. It doesn't necessarily need to be radio frequency microneedling, but if that's what you want to do, it's perfectly fine. Any type of microneedling is good. Please, oh, mm, mm, let me back that train up. Not every type of microneedling is good. In office, microneedling is good. Skin pen, FDA approved devices, radio frequency microneedling in office, those are good. Put down the pen at home. Stop buying Amazon microneedling pens and rollers. The rollers are going to trash your skin. I'm going to do a big fat episode on microneedling, so I'm not going to blow your ears off with this, but put down the microneedling roller. Stop doing it at home by yourself. Your risk of causing so much more harm to your skin than benefit. So in-office professional medical grade microneedling is wonderful. At Radiance Med Spa, we use the skin pen and it's amazing. It's really good to help with skin texture, with pores, reducing the appearance of them, with scars, all types of scars, pigment issues, hyperpigmentation, and it's really great at just building collagen and elastin, so you'll see a reduction in fine lines and wrinkles too. Other treatments that you can do would be lighter types of laser treatments. One of my favorites is the Cool Peel, and that's a more superficial epidermal treatment with a CO2 laser. So we have the Cartessa Tetra CO2 machine in at Radiance, and I love it because I can do a really minimal, non-invasive cool peel treatment on somebody, something that's so light and easy that it does not hurt to get done. I don't even need to put numbing cream on you, and your skin's going to look fine in a couple of days. With that very same laser, I can cut a refrigerator in half. Not exaggerating can literally cut a fridge in half. It is a powerful machine, and I love how versatile it is. That one's also going to get its own episode. Some other laser treatments that you could do would be lighter settings of non-ablative lasers like Fraxel, Moxie, Halo. There's a ton of different brands out there, and a lot of them are really great. But at a really young age, unless you have an active skin issue, there's no reason to go deep and heavy. Um, I'm not going to be taking my 21-year-old with no scarring and normal skin and blasting them with a DECA setting for CO2. It's, it's just kind of inappropriate and your, your risk of problems is higher than what the benefits are going to be. So always have your treatments match what you're trying to treat. There's no point in going super heavy if it's un- unnecessary. Other things that you can do are chemical peels, and those are really great to address a lot of different skin concerns and help boost collagen. The peels are all different. There's a slew of different brands out there, and within the brands, there's different types of peels. So not one peel is going to be like the other. There are no downtime peels, which you're not going to get redness, irritation, and actual physical peeling, but you're going to get that microscopic exfoliation happening, and you're still going to see really nice results in your skin. There's other types of light peels that you will see some peeling, some flaking. Those give you kind of the next level of peel. Then there's medium depth peels. These are medical grade. You're going to have brands like VI Peel. That's the one that we offer at Radiance. There's also another great one out there, the Perfect Derma Peel. That one's very good. VI Peel and Perfect Derma Peel are very similar. Little bit of differences, um, especially when it comes to the pigmentation ones, but very similar. 
those ones you're going to tend to get a little bit more of a deeper peel. And you're going to peel for anywhere from a couple of days to upwards of a week. There are deeper peels than that, but honestly, they're really not done as much anymore um, for, for the pain and discomfort that you go through. Oftentimes, today's lasers, the laser technology is so superior that you don't have to go through that same pain and downtime to get a similar type of result. So things that are deeper than a medium depth peel, eh, in my opinion, maybe take a look at something else. So what are some good products to start using in your early 20s? Now that we know that you're losing 1% of your collagen and elastin starting in your early 20s, it's really good to try to get that stimulated every single day at home. Last episode, I talked about going to the dentist for your cleanings twice a year, but not brushing your teeth at home. Same thing when it comes to skincare. Don't bother coming in for an injectable or Botox or a laser treatment or any of these big ticket items if you're not going to use good quality skincare at home. A lot of the results that you're going to get in your skin are going to be from what you're putting on it every single day. So if we're trying to stimulate collagen production, I want to see things like growth factors and peptides and vitamin C. All of those are really, really great for skin of all ages, but especially when we're trying to target collagen and elastin. Hyaluronic acid serums are also really good. Using a good moisturizer, that's all super important. Uh, Some people are going to be prone to having really dry skin and they, they struggle to get enough moisture in their skin. Now, the difference between a hyaluronic acid serum, which is a hydrator, versus a moisturizer Moisturizers don't put moisture in your skin. They are, have a very, very misleading name. Hyaluronic acid is going to actually pull water into your skin. Some of these serums will actually have peptides in them that'll help your skin make more of its own too. And a moisturizer is going to then lock that in. So first you're going to put on a hyaluronic acid serum to pull that moisture into your skin. And then you're going to put a moisturizer on. It's going to keep it there. So think of a moisturizer as a keep it there. We can target different skin concerns with different products. You know, we can target things like acne, rosacea, excessive dryness, pigmentation, melasma. Melasma is going to be another one. We're going to talk in depth about melasma. That one is, she's a bitch. She's a, she's a fickle bitch. I have her. I should know. Some of my personal favorite products that you quite literally cannot go wrong with come from the skincare line Elastin Skincare. They can be a little bit pricey when you first look at the price tag, but when all is said and done, when putting together a good skincare regimen, you're actually going to be paying less for the Elastin line because it allows you to have a truly minimalistic routine with fewer steps. If you're somebody, um, and most of the men that I treat fall into this category, uh, but a lot of women too. They don't want to do a 10-step routine. They don't have the time to do that in the morning and at night, and they're just going to be non-compliant with it. There's no point in having a countertop full of products that you're not going to use. So what I truly love about Elastin, and there's a laundry list of things that I love about this company, but one of them is the fact that their products do so much. They pack a lot of different active ingredients into each of their bottles. So you can use less and get more. So absolutely love them. Another reason that I love them, I'll do a mini soapbox on Elastin. I am so confident recommending them to all of my patients because they take what they do so seriously. There are clinical studies for every one of their products. They do biopsy testing. So instead of a a company coming up and saying, use our products, they work for this because we say it does. All right, so I'm just supposed to take your word for it. Whereas with Elastin, I can show you. I can show you the white papers. I can show you the biopsies. You can physically see the microscopic improvements in collagen and Elastin and in pigmentation. Their new pigment product, mm, chef's kiss. So good. So, so good. So some of my favorites that can get you started with a really good skincare routine from Elastin, their restorative skin complex. Cannot go wrong with that. It is packed full of different peptides that are going to clear out dead and broken collagen elastin from what I like to call the collagen graveyard layer of your skin. Gets all clogged up with all the broken molecules and gunk. It's going to help clear that out 
other peptides you're going to help stimulate collagen production it's going to also just help regulate your skin tone too that product is not specifically targeted at pigment but it absolutely does help with pigment another one that i love of theirs is ha immerse their ha immerse serum uh, with one of their newer products and that's going to be your hyaluronic acid serum that one is my favorite because not only is, are we putting moisture into the skin, but it also has peptides in it. They're gonna stimulate your skin to create more of its own and to hang on to it. I also just adore, I mentioned it previously, their Illuminate product. That is their most recent one. That's for pigment. And it is the most well-rounded pigment product on the market, in my opinion. It's also really gentle on the skin. You don't have to stop it pre-procedure like hydroquinone and it just targets all the different pathways of pigment. So A plus on that product. I've been using it now for over a month. I'm seeing really nice improvements with sun damage, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and melasma. So chef's kiss, so good. Um, another one of my favorites from them is their restorative eye complex, and that is hands down my favorite eye cream on the market. That one is not going to give you that instantaneous, smooth, tight look to your under eyes, but it's going to be more of a long-term one. So that's going to stimulate collagen, elastin, help with, with discoloration under the eyes. Absolutely love it. And the price point, you can't go wrong with it. Another one that I love is their Hydra Tint. Hydra Tint is one of my holy grail products and take it out of my cold, dead hands. It is a hydrating, mineral-based, tinted sunscreen. Hello. Yes. Yes. All the yes. I genuinely don't have to wear foundation anymore because of this. I don't even wear concealer. I'm like, unless I'm going, you know, trying to go stomp the town, it's not happening. So Hydratin has made me use sunscreen every single day without thinking about it. It gives me a little bit of a drink of hydration. I'm getting my SPF over 30 from a mineral form and the color is for me, perfect. It just blends things out, hides a little bit of my hyperpigmentation, and just evens the skin tone. It is, it's amazing. So recommend that for everybody. Moving on to other brands that I really like, SkinCeuticals. They're really great. Uh, they make some of the best vitamin C serums on the market. They're really known for their CE Ferulic and their Floritin. CE Ferulic is good if you're a bit dry. Floritin is what I recommend for a vitamin C if you're more oily or acne prone. They also have a product that's really good is their blemish and age defense. That one's going to be good for people that are a little bit older, kind of adult acne. Uh, they're going to target with a little bit of salicylic acid as well as a vitamin C. So you're going to get some good, good defense from that. Their HA intensifier is one that I would consider similar to Elastin's Immerse. HA intensifier is going to put hydration into your skin, and then it also is going to help stimulate your skin to hang on to more of it. It's going to downregulate your internal hyaluronidase, which is going to dry you out. Uh, their hydrating B5 gel is another one of my favorites. That's a really silky smooth uh, hydrating gel. It's a, a hyaluronic acid-based gel. Feels really good when you've got that dry skin. Let it drink it up. Their emollients is a really nice basic moisturizer, great for somebody that's anywhere I'd say between mild to moderate dryness. Metacell Renewal, also really, really good. Um, that's really good for people that have pigmentation issues. Recently, I tried their retexturing activator, and that's really nice for people that have more sensitive skin, trying to gently help with fine lines and wrinkles. Um, also really good for uh, that keratosis pilaris that you can get on the back of your arms, kind of those little bumps. Uh, the urea in the retexturing activator is really nice for that. Another skincare line that I love is Zio Skin Health. Some of my favorite kind of highlight products from them would be their Growth Factor Serum. They have a Growth Factor for eye and then one for face. They're both lovely, um, but they are a little bit more um, silicone-y feeling. So they're really good at nighttime. I find that I don't really like them during the day if you're going to be layering a lot of things on top of them. Uh, their Firming Serum is phenomenal. The Firming Serum might be a little bit aggressive for somebody in their early 20s. That's really better for... I would say people in their 30s and up, but hey, if you want to get it, go get it. Uh, their daily power defense is also really nice. That's going to be a daytime preventative, so that's going to help protect your skin from all of the, the daily toxin exposure. 
Bright Alive is a great product of theirs for pigmentation. It's a non-hydroquinone, so very gentle, uh, and that's going to do good for, for different pigmentation issues on the skin, mostly dark, dark, uh, dark spots there. But my one downside with Zio is you need to kind of plan on a multi-step regimen. They use a lot of different products in their regimen, and they're great. They work really well. My patients that I have on a full Zio regimen, their skin is freaking amazing. Their pigment is so much better. Their skin is brighter, tighter, more even toned. So I'm not throwing shade at Zio. The shade that I'm throwing is that if you are somebody that is has a hard time with a multi-step routine, Zio might not be for you. And I might kind of push you more towards Elastin at that point. But all those lines are really, they're really truly great. And we carry all of those at Radiance. We have a couple others as well, but those are some of my favorites. And those would be the ones that I would recommend for my young people in their 20s. Stop washing your face with soap. Get yourself a proper face cleanser for your skin type. We carry a couple of different types. You cannot go wrong with a nice gentle skin cleanser unless you're really oily and acne prone, in which case something more exfoliating and uh, acid-based might be better for you. But Elastin Gentle Cleanser, Zio Gentle Cleanser, love them. They're, they're really great. And just stop overstripping your skin. You're going to end up giving yourself skin problems by washing your face with soap. So cut it out. Another thing that you should start considering is using a retinol or prescription tretinoin and start it early. I have this one patient and I am obsessed with her. She is well into her 70s and her skin is fucking goals. Oh my God, her skin looks amazing. She doesn't even remotely, like she doesn't just look good for her age. She looks good for somebody 10 years younger, maybe even more. Like she has better skin than some of the 40 year olds that I treat. And I asked her last time I saw her, I'm like, what is your secret? Like what your skin is literally goals. And she said, decades of tretinoin use. So you heard it here, go get your tretinoin and you can be a sassy gran all the way up into your, your later years. She looks so good. Oh, so good. So tretinoin is going to help improve your cell turnover. It's gonna help trigger collagen formation. It's gonna help fight dark spots. It's also really great for acne. I mean, honestly, just use it. Just use the tretinoin. Uh, tretinoin can be a little bit tricky to come on to. It's normal to get irritation from it. It does not mean that you are allergic to it. It doesn't mean that you have an intolerance to it. Mind you, some people will because their skin will not improve. But most people, if you can just stick with it and do a proper onboarding of your tretinoin, starting off at a really low percentage, using it just a couple of nights a week with days in between not using it, and slowly increase, your skin's going to thank you and it's going to look so much better. Everybody that I have tretinoin, that, are, that I have using tretinoin right now, I've seen night and day differences in their skin, changing nothing else in their skin, no new procedures. No new anything, just adding tretinoin. Game changer. But it's very normal to have a little bit of irritation at first. Your skin can be a little bit pink, red, sensitized, uh, feel really sensitive to putting other products on. It can feel a little burny. You might even get a peel out of it. It might look like you just had a chemical peel. Either a little bit of flaking or actual peeling, usually around the nose and mouth. It's a really common spot for it. And you just really have to get used to it if you can push through it. One of my best tips and tricks to helping get through the tretinoin onboarding and reducing that irritation is put your tretinoin on at night and then right on top of it I want you to put one pump of the Zio growth factor serum that growth factor serum is so calming and soothing that me with my super sensitive skin can usually get through my onboarding with very minimal irritation as long as I do that now you can get a prescription for tretinoin from the pharmacy, not just walking in. You actually have to have a prescription for it, but it can be a nightmare dealing with your insurance company. Insurance typically will not cover tretinoin after it's like age 16 or 17. It's ridiculous. It's, it's bananas. So they really only cover it for like teenage acne and then they just cut you off. So you have to go through prior authorizations and jump through hoops and it's a nightmare for the prescriber and it's a nightmare for you. And then it ends up being super expensive. And the one that you're going to be picking up from CVS or Walgreens is going to be very basic. It's going to be a carrier cream with the active ingredient in it and that's it. 
So my personal preference is to use compounded 503B products. And those not everybody carries. Um, we do carry them at Radiance. So we carry them in stock or I can send a prescription to that compounding pharmacy and they will ship it to your door. And typically the scripts are going to be under $60. I'd say between $52, $56, $58. I haven't seen any over $58. And the reason they're so great is because they're blended with other beneficial ingredients. So you're going to get less skin irritation. Your skin's going to tolerate it better and you're going to get other benefits out of it too. Uh, we do blends of just niacinamide and tretinoin and that one comes with like green tea extract and hyaluronic acid and all sorts of good stuff uh, and we can even make them special for acne so you're going to have like a topical clindamycin tretinoin spironolactone Ooh, wait until next week episode topical spironolactone hello uh, so we can do all these types of different blends we can even do uh, hydroquinone and tretinoin at different strengths so we can really tailor it to what your needs are and like I said, we carry a lot of them in the office, but if we don't have in stock in the office what you specifically need, I'm just going to send the script over to the pharmacy. Uh, one word of warning when it comes to tretinoin is you do need to stop that before having certain procedures done, um, particularly lasers or microneedling or chemical peels, um, even facials. You need to come off of it for at least seven days prior. Otherwise, we can create a little bit of a, a storm on your face and we're not going to do that to you. So if you come in and you say that you used tretinoin the night before, we're unfortunately going to turn you away. So my last bit of advice when it comes to treating the young patient is don't forget your neck, your chest, and your hands. Uh, you know, I tell that to people of all ages, but it's really important to start that at a young age. Drag all your products that you're putting on your face, except for the acne ones, unless you have acne in those areas, onto your neck, your chest, and even the back of your hands. And this definitely in includes sunscreen. Our hands are going to give us away. You're going to get dark spots. The skin's going to get thin. Uh, it's, you're just going to look craggly and witchy. You don't want witchy hands. Uh, they do also make targeted products for these areas. My favorite are the Elastin Restorative Neck Complex and Zeo Growth Factor Serum. Those two are my favorite to put on my neck and my chest. And so I'm going to be circling back to talking about the young patient when I do have other guests on. So you're going to get some input and other opinions from other treating providers. Uh, we want to hear about all the youngins and what we're doing. And we'll also talk about some so social media trends and how that's influencing what my young patients are doing. Thank you so much for listening today. If you have any questions, please email justapinchpodcast at gmail.com or shoot me a DM on Instagram at justapinchpodcast and I'll answer any questions that you have on the next episode. If you're enjoying Just a Pinch, please take a moment to follow, subscribe, like, rate, and review on whichever listening platform you enjoy. Just a Pinch Podcast was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Kristen Jem.